Hi everybody. Okay, so this is the video you've all been waiting for where we're going to dig into um, the structure of music and what to do when we're practicing structure. So let me just do a quick recap. Um, and that is to say that the, the thing that I want you all to remember every time we talk about one of these elements is that structure doesn't exist in isolation. Structure is one of the three important elements um, of creating a solid interpretation. We have technique, the ability to play a passage. We have emotion, the reason why we're playing the passage or what we're trying to convey with the musical passage. And of course, technique, sorry. And then of course, structure, which is how the music is constructed. The harmonies, the rhythm, the, the melodic contour, all of those exciting things. Um, and I think the trap that we all fall into is that we have one of these elements, one of these pillars that speaks loudly to us. Um, for me, it's the emotion I'm the most intrigued and um, in love with the emotion that the music is trying to convey. Uh, technique is something that I'm fascinated by and structure is the thing that uh, for a very long time uh, bore me to tears. So for me, it was about balancing the equation and making sure that um, I, I understood structure as, as it is, as it stands, but also be able to take that understanding and um, make it a part of the interpretation. So again, n none of these three elements is more important than the other. Emotion is important, structure is important, technique is important. They have to find um, a balance, and since I can actually use some visual aids here, um, if you can imagine this, if we have, you know, technique here and we have emotion here and we have structure here, what we're looking for is this beautiful section over here where all three meet and create this um, very organic combination of elements. Um, and I'm sorry I'm so slow, this is after a long day of practicing and I decided I'm going to do this, so just bear with me. Um, so yeah, so we talked, I made the videos about techniques, so you have that, and I now wanted to make the videos about structure. So the first segment, or this first chunk, is just going to be about me going through the list of the things to be aware of. Um, and then we'll go, as you can see, I have a lot of examples here that I'm going to show you, and hopefully that will help clarify things. Okay, so very, very quickly. The first thing that we do when we get a new piece of music as we look and we are working on the structure clearly is we're looking at the overall structure of the piece. What is it? Is it a sonata form? Is it an ABA? Is it um, variation? Is it a rondo? Is it a rondo sonata? We try to use the terminology, the musical terminology to decide what the structure of the thing is. Um, and I'm already going to say, to jump in and say that learning musical structure is is a lifelong endeavor. You're never going to get to the end of it. There's always something to learn about, um, again, about form, about harmony. So if you're not sure about what the form is, if all you have is an ABA or, you know, um, a rondo A, B, A, C, A, if you have those letters in mind, then you're already a step ahead of the game. And I want to encourage you to never be scared of guessing the structure uh, and just using basic letters to tell you what you think is happening because that's really the most important thing is that you come with something that is authentic it's your understanding of what's happening in the music and then if you get to the level where you actually know what the the proper terminology is then good for you but that is really not the point the point is for you to to look at the music and try to make sense of how it is constructed okay so the first step what's the overall structure um, then we break it into sections so if we have a sonata form, it will be an exposition, um, development and recapitulation. If we have a rondo, then obviously where does the theme repeat and so on and so forth. And then comes the part that I think most people sort of stop because to some extent it comes very naturally, but that's the dividing the piece into phrases. So if you just, just uh, looking at what I have in front of me here, the Schubert impromptu, you see obviously the first phrase starts here and I would mark this is the beginning of the phrase and obviously the section, the sh small section ends here and then subdivisions um, or subdivisions to the phrase. 
I would say a comma here, then end. And then we repeat the beginning. Kind of hard to play around the tripod, so bear with me. So you see four four measures, four measures, four measures, four measures. The beginning repeats. Basically, that's all marking the phrase is. Why is that helpful? Because sometimes we have crazy phrases that are in five measures, or we have something like two plus four or four plus six. It's not always as neat and tidy as um, this opening here. Um, and maybe in future videos I'll show you examples of uh, some more complicated phrases and where marking the phrase really becomes a critical uh, a critical element. I, I think it's always critical, but, but especially when things are uneven or unexpected or unusual. Um, so yeah, so that's marking the phrases. I also find that especially when you have a very long piece and you're, you know, drudging through page 16, it helps to know what section you're in, what phrase you're in, and just help the brain sort of slice things down, chunk it down, so you're dealing with something that is manageable, a phrase, and not 18 pages of music. Okay, so this is sort of the preliminary work. We mark, I sometimes put the number one at the beginning of the big phrases, like so. Hopefully you can, I hope you can see this, but... Um, okay, then... Moving on, we look at the, the first thing that I would do is to look at the harmony. And again, just as a side note, you can do any of the things I'm about to state in different order or do some of them and not all of them. It's really up to you. I'm just going through the list as I like to do it and makes sense to me. But by no means is there uh, a right or wrong way of doing this. So I will start first with the harmony. And what I'm looking for is you know, first of all, you know, establish the key and tell yourself what you're in. Uh, oh, it helps that it says up here. And just so you know what the context is, like where are we starting, what's the, the major tonality of the piece, and now we're starting to look for things that are common, uncommon, uh, modulations, interesting harmonies, things that are unexpected. Some people will tell you, no, just put the Roman numeral next to each and every harmony, um, and as you know, I like to write a lot in the music, but I think that the point of going through the harmonic analysis of the piece is to find the unusual points. It's not just to write, oh, A flat and a dominant, because those really are not the exciting, not that it's not exciting, they, they're not the, the special points, they're not the things that you're going to actually have to carry into the performance part of things. But just if you look at this phrase and we see, you know, the A flat, the dominant, so far now this is sexy why is it sexy because it takes us to F minor only for a brief moment because so I would as part of my harmonic analysis I would put an exclamation point here just to remind myself ah, that's an important moment um, some other examples coming later when we see here that minor G flat chord, and then the that deceptive. So again, I, we're, I'm not going to go and stop over every measure, but basically what we're looking for is the unusual points in the piece, the harmonies that sort of. Um, do an unexpected motion, an unexpected move, um, and I think I think you guys are getting the point. So that's the harmony. Um, yeah. Then I'm, and I'm I'm going to give you more examples after I finish um, the list. The next step is looking at the melodic line, um, and this is where it gets. I mean, it's, it's all tricky, but this is where it gets tricky because. People will have different ideas about what is unusual, what is expected, or where the phrase is going. So, again, bear with me that there's no right and wrong here, just people's um, sensitivities and taste. That's, you know, to be honest, it's really about taste. So, if we look at the melody here, um, 
we start on the tonic leading to the third of the chord. So far, nothing spectacular. That's a big interval, that six, so it, it is something to the tonic. Here, that fifth is interesting, right? To close the phrase. And then we jump up an octave. That's exactly the beginning, just an octave higher. And even though it's exactly the same as the melody before, because of the harmony, it gets a completely different color. So um, maybe this is not the best example to show you the melodic contour. So let, let me find something else. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and give you a better example of um, the melodic contour idea. So if you look with me here at the, this is the second movement of Mozart, um, case 330, you see that if you look at the beginning, we're in F major. So that's suspension. Of course, the harmony is the deceptive cadence, the deceptive cadence there. But again, you can see that the entire melodic line is going to that G. Why is that important? Because if we have to interpret this phrase, we have to look at how would we play this beautiful melodical line. Are we going to that chord? Are we going to the tonic chord? Are we going to the dominant? Are we going to the deceptive cadence? So all of these are questions, are really important questions, because if we just look at the if we just look at the melodic line, there are many points that we could consider the, the climax of the phrase, or the peak of the phrase, or the top of the phrase. Probably, well, the, the highest note is the F. Maybe that's the peak of the phrase. Um, let's keep going. If we go... What's the peak there? What's the point of the phrase? What's the focal point? So looking at the intervals, the octave or the dissonance here sort of gives you a clue of what the phrase wants to do. What are the important notes? Um, and again, what's interesting about this example is that it coincides with the harmonic um, critical points. So in a way, the two are you know are merging together um, and sort of tell you that yes, the first arrival point is going to be here into the D minor. Um, another important arrival point uh, is the that beautiful dissonant on the C sharp. Um, another example that I have here from Brahms Intermetto Opus 117 number 3, if you look at the, at the melody, that's one cell. Now we're getting bigger, higher. very clear example where we say, oh, the melodic contour is clearly going to the B. So what does that mean? It means that at the beginning of the phrase, we need to stay simple. So we take this um, entire chunk as one thing and not just, oh, and we don't start making... Um, a big deal out of every every small melodic cell, but we have a bigger picture that goes all the way to the fourth measure. And this is, by the way, another great example of where marking phrases is important because if you count with me, one, two, three, four, five measure phrase. Um, so again, an anomaly, not common, and something that we should definitely be aware of. Okay, so hopefully you understand the part about looking at the melodic contour and deciding what's the focal point of the phrase, what's the most important no note in that phrase. The next element we're going to talk about is rhythm. And 
again, there's so many things that you could do in terms of um, structural understanding and rhythm, anything from, I know that most of you know that I like to make people conduct and play at the same time. So you can conduct with the right hand, you can and play with the left and vice versa. You can count hypermeasures. So for example, here we would count one, Hypermeasure, this comes from Schnabel, um, and what it does, counting through the measure lines, creates this one wave, one motion through the phrase. So if before we would count one and two and one and two, we actually add downbeats, emphasis on the downbeats that really should not be there. We should really be playing all the way to the fourth measure, and counting in hypermeasures really, really helps. Whoops. Um, push that point uh, forward and sort of avoid unnecessary downbeats. Uh, again, I'll, I'll do more examples in a second, um, but I think in terms of rhythm, that those are basically the two important things. Conduct, so you can decide, um, let me see if I can do this with a tripod. If, if I had to conduct this opening, what would I do? Would I conduct it in two? Can you see my fingers? One, two. Yeah. So if it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So clearly that you feel a very nice two and if if you get grooving with that conducting then I think you get a really nice motion. Um, let me show you an example where, yeah, let's go back to the Schubert, and in the Schubert, you could say, well, let's conduct this in three. One, two, three. One, two, three. But how about if we conducted it in measures? One. completely different feeling. So now we have to decide what's an allegretto and how do we want to feel this impromptu. If we want to feel it in measures, we want to feel it in quarter notes, and I'm sure that there are good arguments for either one of those options. I just want to present you with the tools of investigating both, and then you can make um, an informed decision based on what just sound, sounds better for you. Okay, the fourth thing on this list of structural analysis is probably one of the things that is hardest for me to explain, so please bear with me, but it has to do with tension um, in a phrase and between the voices. So if you look with me here, well, we're out of focus, here we go. If you look with me at the opening and we identify these different voices, if this is the bass, the tenor, alto gets a lot, um, and soprano, you see that there's a motion forward here all the way to the C, then, so I would mark that as a forward arrow. Meanwhile, these syncopations, the for me, are resisting the bass motion. So I would put this arrow. And together, and not just the left hand. Now what's happening in the right hand? We have the syncopations here. Again, you could you could say are either are they imitating the tenor line? By resisting the motion in the bass, or are they pushing forward and they're resisting the soprano line? Again, so this is a for me the soprano line is definitely doing this and the syncopation here is actually moving forward. Why is this helpful? Because you would notice in a lot of cases um, we tend to go 
we te- we tend to move things in sort of unilateral way like everything is going to move forward or everything is going to hold back but if you start looking at the individual voices and start asking yourself the question of which one is moving forward which one is holding back um is there a clear pattern um here when you see all of the chords moving uh, in the same direction some of these voices are moving forward and some of these forward or some some of these voices are resisting and that gives the music a lot of tension a lot of drama if you just go forward then it's sort of an avalanche effect and just things are getting out of control so again more on that later but think about the issues of tension between the different voices and see if that gives you any kind of insight into what should happen in the phrase the last thing i'm going to say is about breath and how to breathe with the phrase and i apologize there's noise here on the street um this came to me after I played a performance of um, of Prokofiev's Six Piano Sonata, and one of my friends said, um, "Dude, I never want to come hear you play again because you were not breathing for the last 30 minutes." And at first, I was kind of shocked that he said that, and then when I thought about it, he was right. I was holding my breath throughout the whole performance, and when he said, "You just have to breathe," my first thought was, "Well, breathe how? If the music is tense." and there's a lot going on, should I be hyperventilating or should I be just holding my breath and you know exhaling at the end of a page? Like how exactly are you supposed to be reading while playing a very complex piece of music? And that led me to thinking about is there a way to organically breathe with the phrase and is there a way to breathe against the phrase? Now this is very different from what our colleagues uh, you know, with the wind uh, instrument family do with you know the oboe and the clarinet where they have to sustain the breath from the beginning to the end because otherwise there won't be sound. What we're doing is we're trying to figure out how the phrase is operating and as a result how can we breathe with it. I think those are two fundamentally different ideas and you know we should be careful to not confuse the two. So if we look at our Schubert friend here, um, I'm going to transpose it up an octave just because the tripod is in the middle here. Um, so you could say that the first measure is going to be an out breath. Then we're going to take air with this one. Exhale in. So it's an out breath, in breath, out, in. And that helps also establish the, the feeling of the phrase in measures rather than in quarters. Is that the only way to do it? No, and I actually had very interesting discussions with um, a couple of pianists a few years ago where everything that I said I thought the, the breathing should be, my colleague said, no, I feel it's exactly the opposite. So again, there is no right and wrong here, just what feels natural. So to quickly recap, we identified the structure, we broke the piece into segments and into phrases, we looked at the harmony, we looked at the melody, we looked at the rhythm via conducting and uh, hypermeasures, we looked at tension between the voices and we tried to find a way to comfortably breathe with the phrase. Those are the things that I think are imperative for us to know when learning a piece of music. And again, there are, of course, many, many different levels that you could do this analysis at from just touching on important points to really going measure by measure and figure out what's going on. Um, before I, I end this video and go into the specific examples, ah, that was a motorcycle. Um, let me just go through my list here and see if I want to mention anything else. No, I think we're good. So, yeah, I'm going to finish this. Okay, so thank you for hanging in with me here and um, Hopefully this will make sense when I go into the specific examples. Ciao. Okay, I'm back and um, we're going to look at the middle section of the Mozart Sonata K330. Um, let's start with the harmony and I'm looking right here. So the piece itself was in F major. But when we get into the middle section, we're going into F minor. Let's look at the harmonies first. We're still in F. We're going into the dominant. 
but back. Now something magical happens. D flat. Can you hear that? From that dark F minor to the light of the D flat. major. But then we go back to F minor, to the dark, and again this, this incredible modulation that happens right here. I think it even happens before we hear the D flat chord. It just so as you can see, if I'm just playing the notes, beautiful but I completely missed the point of this silence here I completely missed the point of going from the darkness of the opening F minor to you know this transcendent light and what's incredible is if we go on is if ba E flat but it brings us back to F minor so again the A flat E flat does the opposite journey from the light into the dark. Uh, okay, let's look at the melody. So already here we have a lot of tempting things to do because we have as a long note, so even though there's no melodic contra really, just a repeated note, we want to sort of rest on this dotted quarter. But that's just the beginning, so probably we shouldn't do that, right? third, even more, the triton. So, what's the important note? The B flat or the E? Or the resolution? So many options. This is going to be more dramatic at the beginning because of the harmonic change. start, even with the harmonic change here, we're going to build all the way to the F. So that's, that's really the peak. And from here it's just a resolution and a diminuendo. So I would take my pencil, I would say, okay, I think this is the culmination of the phrase. I want to do something here to show that beautiful third. And I'm definitely going to do something here to show that it's different harmony than the beginning. The F minor versus the dominant. Um, yeah, I think this is all I want to say about this example. Um, ah, I know, I want, I want to talk about the tension here, because this is a great example to see how... So for me, this note is pushing forward, the pedal point, and these notes are resisting. Meanwhile, in the sixes, the C is pushing, the A flat is resisting. Here it flips. So you would say, oh, okay, oh, so every time it goes up, the bottom is pushing, the top is resisting, and then every time it goes down, the top is pushing, and the bottom is resisting. Usually, yes, but not always, which is where this is getting exciting because you really have to carefully look at what's happening in the phrase. Um, I would say that 80% of the time that would be true but not always. Um, yeah, I think this is all I want to say about this example. Let's go on to the next. Okay, the next example is this beautiful Schubert impromptu. Um, let's do this. Um, and let, let's go through the through the checklist and see what we can learn from doing a structural analysis of this. So, 
the thing that we maybe I didn't mention in the earlier um, videos is that the idea of harmonic rhythm and how fast a harmony changes um, in a phrase is really critical to both how you're going to play the piece but also to your uh, decision regarding tempo. And as you can see this opening we have the arpeggiation of the A flat minor. <laughs> Again. So if we play this, there's something stagnant about that tempo because it really doesn't take into consideration the fact that the overwhelming harmony in this opening phrase is really just that A flat um, minor chord. There's really nothing happening. I mean, I should. Caveat, of course, there's a lot happening, but harmonically, there's not a lot happening until we hit um, this point here. We modulate to C flat major. So looking at the harmony is not only an issue of where do the harmonies um, change and what what are some of you know the surprising harmonic elements, but it's really an issue of how fast those changes are occurring. So that's the harmony here. In terms of, I don't really have anything to say spectacularly about the the melodic contour here, but looking at the rhythm, I think is really important. So if you, again, three, four, you can count this in three, but you can also count this in measures. And when you combine that with the breath, I think something really beautiful happens because if the first measure is an out breath and the second measure is an in breath, we get a real beautiful sort of flow to the whole thing. So this would be out. In. Out. And we start with an out. Out. So this next passage is really wonderful to see. I'm going to start here and you see that this phrase, these four harmonies or this four measure phrase that goes to the D flat, dominant, tonic. If you look with me through this page, repeat this, these four um, chords, these four harmony repeat again and again and again. Each time with a slight variation, we're going to get an inner voice here. But what does that mean that these four measures repeat again and again? It means that we should not get stuck on them. It means that the real culmination is going to happen when we actually change the harmonies here uh, and we go into the minor, the B flat minor, but that there is a perpetual motion that he creates by repeating the same harmonies over and over. Um, let's count this in hypermeasures. So let's see how that works. One, two, three, what are some of the options here? I can do one, two, relax the three, and relax even more the four. Maybe more natural ways to go to the three. So one, two, three, four. Let's try the opposite. One, two. That's a valid option too. But in every one of these versions, I'm looking for a relationship between these four harmonies. How would I breathe with this phrase? So, start taking air in, more, and exhale. So it's really, we breathe out, we exhale here, take an in-breath for two, and then exhale on the, on the last one. And what's created is sort of this, um, I can't really draw, but, so that the culmination of the phrase happens here at the culmination of the breath. If we look at, um, I want to look at, at this area over here to show you how the tension works because this is really all forward motion, right? But the inner melody resists. So this is forward, but this is holding back. Now if I just went forward, I miss something really beautiful about this counterpoint. 
Lambert puts these accents here, we get another element of, oh, he actually wants us to resist the forward motion. And the forward motion is also happening because we're repeating the same harmonic pattern again and again. So there's a lot of inertia um, happening here. The right hand, I think the right hand really is resisting as well. I think the forward motion is happening mainly in the bass and the right hand and the tenor line are resisting. So. So this is simple. Can't get past the <laughs> tripod. Back. And so you get the picture. Um, yeah, I think those are the important points that I wanted to show with this passage is that a, to understand that these four harmonies repeat again and again. B, that we need to decide on which one of these harmonies is the most important. C, that you could do different things with these four harmonies. You don't always have to do a crescendo to the third measure. And four, that when we get this inner line, the idea of what's moving forward and what's holding back becomes really critical to avoid falling into this perpetuum um, motion of moving forward again and again, more and more and more and more. So hopefully that made sense and I'll move on to the next example. Hi, I'm just going to talk quickly about this idea of tension again with these two examples here. So if you look at the opening, this is Brahms Intermezzo, uh, Opus 117, number 3. What's so striking about this unison is that I feel that there's a lot of tension in this motion. We, we mentioned before that it's all going to the fourth measure of a five measure phrase, but if you Following with me here, you see that the right hand has a lot of resistance, so I would mark it with the back arrow. It tries to move forward, but it resists. Only here. So all of this, all of this is like one big resisting arrow all the way to the B, and then finally it Re releases and moves forward. But then the question is, what are these two voices doing here in the octave? And where I think it gets really exciting is that when you separate this octave into two voices, so the left hand is going to push forward, the bottom, I should say, the bass, um, and the upper voice of the octave is going to resist. And that will create this tension in the left hand. I'm going to separate for now, but... pinky and fourth finger are going to push forward, my thumb is going to try and resist. And so on. And then together you get this beautiful mixture of things that are moving forward and, and voices that are resisting. resisting. point here. If I'm just playing the melody, there's no tension in that. But if I look more deeply into um, how this texture, texture is constructed, and I imagine this three separate instrument, and I'm trying to look at what's the tension between them, what's moving forward, what's holding back, then I create a much more complex sonority with the phrase. Again, the contour of the phrase is still going to the same place. We did not change that. We're just looking at what's happening between these voices. Another example is, uh, we're going back to our friend, the Schubert Impromptu in A-flat, is the motion here. And what's, we, we saw examples similar to that previously where the bass is pushing forward, the, the D-flat is pushing forward, and the A-flat is resisting. But 
what's more interesting is what's happening in the right hand because there's really a, um, a struggle between the two voices. So if you look, resisting, this is pushing forward, that's resisting, that's pushing forward. So all of these are moving forward and all of these are holding backward. And that creates a really incredible tension in that phrase. forward and the bottom is resisting. Flips again. the craziest set of videos I've ever made um, and obviously if you have questions please leave in the comments below um, and I will try to come up with more examples better examples for you to use as reference but clearly every piece is going to be different is going to ask you to do a different kind of analysis come up with different conclusions but the basic desire to understand the musical structure in front of you should always be there and obviously the more time you spend doing it the better you get and the last thing I'm going to say is that um, when sometimes when I look at old scores of analysis that I've made of all the pieces and I I think who wrote this and what was I thinking or what was I smoking when I was doing this just to show that with age with time your perspective changes you will come up with different conclusions so there is no right and wrong, there is just the perspective of the moment you're doing in and what sounds good in that moment and you are more than welcome to change your opinion um, about tempo, about phrasing, about what's important, what should be in the background. It's a lifelong process. Okay, I hope you all having a great summer and I'll talk to you later. Bye.